Welcome to the Retrospect Podcast, a show where people come together from different walks of life and discuss a topic from their generation's perspective. My name is Ian, and as always, I'm joined by Stoney. Hello. And Jason. Hello, everyone. I got your uh, your proper name this time. I didn't mess it up <laughs> last time. That's okay. Um, that was some funny stuff it right was. there. That was awesome. Yeah, that was good in the moment because I it, it happened and I didn't even uh, think about it. And I was like, oh, okay, well. Uh, we're good. We're all good. It, I uh, I feel like I have to do um, the, the what's, what's tradition on this show, and um, we are squarely in summertime. It is hot outside, and I am. It's brutal. And hot. I'm kind of sad because I'm like I'm missing those like uh, our like springtime kind of lasted a little while where like there was a few days that weren't so bad, and I'm like, man, I feel like I. It, we're still I wish I in some more. spring, technically. technically. No, I thought June 1st was the first day of summer. No. That's the it first day of like hurricane it. season. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think it's June 21st. Is oh, wow. the Really? First, yes, it's the, first, it's the summer equinox. Oh, you're right, you're right. So that's well. actually the beginning of summer. So, But, you know, I had a feeling mm. that we did have a, an early, yeah. our early spring was cool. Yeah, and it lasted for a pretty good amount of time. There and was a I bunch said, of, when the you know, heat hits, it's going to hit with a vengeance. And it seemed like every day on my phone, it's mm-hmm. it's excessive heat warning, excessive heat warning, <laughs> excessive heat warning. And I'm going to tell you, trying to run and do the Mm-mm. things I do, uh, it, it can just flat out be brutal. Oh, I yeah. mean, it's just, uh, I mean, the amount of water I, I have to drink, and sometimes I can imagine. it's not even enough. Right. Because you just sweat so much. Right. So, but, you know. Just well, they say pride. water is not really the best thing for hydration. You got to have it, mm-hmm. but milk and some of the other juices are actually better for hydration because the water passes through you so right. fast, you don't retain it. Right. But if you drink something else like milk, you retain some of that. Even eating melon mm-hmm. and things like that are better for hydration. Yeah. I'm not a doctor. Yeah, they right, say right, right. also. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I yeah. stayed at a Holiday Inn, and you know, Co- <laughs> you I read, it on, the the end, read it on a YouTube video. But you know, Co- coconut water is is really good yes. for hydration. Really? Yes, it's sad. a lot of potassium. I don't like in coconut, coconut water. water, but you also need magnesium. Yeah, coconut water. I don't like the the really feeling and the taste of it. I yeah. don't. I just don't like it. Yeah, I, I actually tried. Um, uh, some of the uh, product that you uh, you mm-hmm. and Miranda gave me uh, this past Tuesday, and I could tell a difference. Yes, interesting. Yes, hmm. uh, matter of fact, uh, and you know, I don't like to drink a lot of water right before I run because then my stomach feels kind of full, you sloshing, and you're around. sloshing around, <laughs> and everything. So right, but I, I did sip on that for about thirty minutes before I ran, mm-hmm. and. Uh, it, I definitely could tell it, it kept me going. Okay. Wow. It okay. Was, That's good. I'll it, let her know. Yeah. It was a, uh, um, it, it was just, it was hot. Oh, actually, mm-hmm. you'll see her tomorrow. You can let her know. Yeah. There you go. Mm-hmm. Well, um, for this lovely episode today, I have never seen Jason walk in with, I think, such a big stack <laughs> of papers. And man, I, he walked in and I, and he sat down on the table and I was like, I'm a little intimidated now. <laughs> <laughs> Most times you guys come prepared with documents. And I'm, I'm usually just a guy who asks questions here. Yeah, you know, but I feel horrifically underprepared for this episode. <laughs> well, I, I think I overprepare for, for these for these episodes because I don't really know where my thoughts are going to go with right. a particular topic. And I kind of want to have as much material as I can draw upon to talk about. Right. So there's a lot of material for this person. Right. Uh, a lot. There's a lot, and and it, you know, I learned some things actually doing some research on this. So okay, good stuff. So, so I'm looking forward to talking about her. So what happened to Amelia Earhart? Well. You know, dun, dun, I, I dun. think I, I, let, before we let, let's let's kind of talk about her and her upbringing before just kind of briefly okay, yeah, kind of yeah, give yeah. a backdrop of, of right. who she was, where she comes from. Especially the and, time period. Exactly. Too. So, yeah. I mean, because I think that leads you to uh, uh, kind of appreciate who she was. And, and it's funny. I, I wrote this little statement down. 
that I thought really encapsulated her life. All right. And it's from a recent rock song. Uh oh. All right. I've got something to say. It's better to burn out than to fade away. Oh, man. So, and that is for everybody who doesn't know, that's from uh, Def Leppard's Rock of Ages <laughs> song. There you go. But uh, I, I really thought that statement really captures what Amelia Earhart was. Mm-hmm. She was someone that really pushed a lot of boundaries. Right. Um, Amelia Earhart was born on July 24th, 1897. And she was born in her grandparents' house in Atchison, Kansas. Odd fact for our oh. listeners. July 24th is Miranda and I's wedding anniversary. Wow, there you go. <laughs> well, that's Amelia Earhart Day, believe that's it or right. not. Wow. wow. Okay. So, um, All right. But she was born into privilege. Right. Um, uh, her, her parents, Samuel uh, Edwin Stanton Earhart and Amelia Amy Otis Earhart, um, uh, you know, the, the, the grandfather, from what I understand, was a very prominent attorney in Atchison, Kansas. Mm-hmm. I see. So they had money. Right. Unfortunately, the father didn't really kind of do what <laughs> grandpa did. Right. And so there were problems. Um, but she was, uh, um, uh, she was taught at home by her mother and a governess until age 12. Wow. And then went to Hyde Park High School in Chicago. Um, her parent uh, in 1919, she prepared into Columbia University to enroll in medical studies, but quit a year later to be with her parents, which had reunited in California. So I think, from what I understand, her parents divorced, mm. and then in 1924. But then eventually, uh, I think somehow they ended up back together, and they were living in in. Uh, in California, wow. but uh, yeah, so she was. Uh, uh, fun fun go- fact: she was the fourteenth female to receive a pilot's license. Yeah, there you go. That's right, and 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 she and was. It's attributed to possibly um, being put as a child, a young person in an airplane, and feeling that. She um, got with somebody in her family and some friends, and they built a homemade roller coaster. And the first ride of that roller coaster did not end very well. She went flying. Uh But she said the adrenaline rush from that caused her to want to push boundaries and push and push and push. Yeah, she was uh, a—actually, she was introduced— to uh, to flight uh, to, to flying in Long Beach, California. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, her and her father visited an airfield where Frank Hawks, who is a, a gentleman who who gained fame later later on in life as an air racer, gave her a ride that lasted ten minutes mm-hmm. and cost her father ten bucks. <laughs> that wow. began her obsession with flying. Matter of fact, I quote in her book Last Flight. By the time I had gotten two or three hundred feet off the ground, I knew I had to fly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it she got the bug immediately. Um, but she was a bit of a rebel. Oh yeah. Also, she was very much someone who didn't kind of conform conform to, what to the people thought the you gender be at the time. roles yes. of the time right. and. Uh, she was very much involved in, in kind of pushing those boundaries a little bit. Um, matter of fact, she founded a line of clothing oh. in 1933. There you go. And she said it was for women who live actively. Oh, okay. So, um, but yeah, she, uh, she's she got a, a lot of records um, that she, she broke. Right. Um, she was the first woman to fly the Atlantic solo. And the only person to fly it twice. Yep. The wow. longest nonstop distance flown by a woman and a record for crossing in the shortest time. In August 24th, 25th, 1932, she flew from Los Angeles, California to Newark, New Jersey in a record 19 hours, five minutes, flying a Lockheed Vega. Mm, yeah. Also becoming the first woman to fly solo coast to coast. And she got involved with air racing, and and she managed to uh, place fifth in a uh, 
uh, in an air race, and she uh, in the 1935 Bendix Trophy race, um, and did very well. Right. Um, she considered, you know, she was in a plane that basically I think the speed topped out like 195 miles an hour against people that were racing in planes that were close to 300 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. um, she was obviously a very skilled pilot. Right. And, um, and she also, in 1935, she became the first person to fly solo from Honolulu, Hawaii to Oakland, California. Wow. And she departed Wheeler Field on January 11th, 1935 and landed in Oakland, California to a cheering crowd of thousands. President Roosevelt sent his grad- congratulations. You have scored again and shown even the doubting Thomases, and this is a quote from Franklin Roosevelt, shown even the doubting Thomases that aviation is a science which cannot be limited to men only. There you go. So, but she and was... And there was a ticker tape parade for that. I mean, huge. Yeah. These, yeah. these were the rock stars. These oh, were the yeah. celebrities of uh, the time. No doubt. I mean, that's some tape. They threw for people, you know, I often, I, I, it's so like a, a gilded age, so to speak. Oh, I mean, yeah. it's a how people were recognized for really true greatness right? versus what I think how people are celebrated nowadays. Mm-hmm. Um, real accomplishments. Real accomplishments. I mean, really pushing the boundaries of, of, of you know, of, of science or whatever the case may and, be. And they weren't sitting on somebody else's laurels. Exactly. They, they, you know, this woman, Amelia Earhart, actually helped design her plane that she was going to use to circumvent the equator, basically. Right. right. This was going to be as close to cir- just going completely around the equator. If you could, she made and helped design how this plane was going to be. Yep. She right. was that hands-on with it. Yep. That's in, amazing. I guess me. in our defense, like in that time too, like I, it felt like, you know, there are these big steps, like going from, you know, horse-drawn carriages to having like some sort of you know model t to then of course you know being able to fly like some yeah. and then of course like these huge steps i feel like we talked about a little bit about the industrial revolution how just like there's just this explosion of technology and even throughout like all the 1900s i feel like there's a lot of those things where like i feel like it's slowed down a little bit and like there's these like there's these jumps but i feel like it's hard to I feel like there's um, there are some things nowadays that are like p- truly revolutionary, but like n- nothing quite probably like that, <laughs> you know. Yeah, she she you know she she eventually she she had she had broken off her engagement with Samuel Chapman in 1928, and eventually she married a guy by the name of George Putman. Mm-hmm. In in 1931, oh, I'm not sure which one that was, but he asked her like 30 times. Yes, to marry her. It goes. he goes. He was persistently, yeah. yes. you know, and she but, kept telling him, "No, I'm not going to be saddled and, down." And, and, a, and I'm going to tell you, this is funny. In a letter to him on their wedding day, I quote this: Uh-oh. "If you want, I want you to understand. I shall not hold you to any medieval code of faithfulness to what? me." Mm-hmm. nor shall I consider myself bound to you similarly. So when I tell you she was definitely someone that predated her time when it came yeah. to this, she says, like, I'm with you, but I'm really not with you. And yeah. and my first passion will always be flying. It won't be you. Right. Um. So, and... Another quote I found funny because she won numerous awards. Right. Uh, she won the Flying Cross Award from Congress, the Cross of Knight of the Legion of Honor from the French government, and the Gold Medal of the National Geographic Society from President Hoover. Wow. Where they, in an article that the French press, she responded to this article that the French press wrote, kind of showing the times. The article ended, Can She Bake a Cake? Wow. And her response was, so I accept these awards on behalf of the cake bakers and all those <laughs> other women who can do some things quite as important, if not more important than flying, as well as in the name of women flying today. Wow. So wow. she had a bit of an attitude. She was about, a fireball. She was a fireball, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, some of the things that she did, 
you know, I can see how you would kind of have to have that. But you see, I, th- I think it's that attitude and things like that that have kind of spurred some of the uh, the conspiracies surrounding her death. Um, the um, official story is that they crashed and were never found. But there's a couple of stories out there, and one of them is um, that the men of the time were tired of her taking all their thunder. Because, like, like Ian said, there were so many hurdles being met at this time, so many records being broken, so many things happening. This was ticker tape stuff. This wasn't like today where, you know, you get a little blurb here or there. This is stuff that w- when you did something like this, 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 the news went across the globe. Yeah. She was stealing everybody's thunder at this time, and um, she was hard to get along with because of her attitude. So one of the interesting conspiracies is is that even with her co-pilot Noonan, men were getting tired of her stealing their thunder. And some people found a set of bones on one of the islands, and they only found what they think was her bones. Mm-hmm. And so they wonder maybe if he didn't down the plane, kill her, desert her on this island, and they were waiting to take him away, and he left and went and lived another life somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, now, there's mean, no... There are, a lot of, there are a lot of theories out there of, of what happened. And of course, now you'd have to go back and, and back up and, and kind of what led her to want to try to circumnavigate the globe. Mm-hmm. She tried one time before. They had took off from an airfield, I believe it was in Hawaii, and the plane had a, a landing a, a landing gear failure, and it broke off while they were trying to take off. Mm-hmm. And so they scrapped the flight. And so her goal was to um, it was to do this. And so eventually, the the original route was to go from west to eat to uh, from leaving. I think from the west coast. And then going across the globe that way, like toward Japan in that area. Right. And then circulating the globe that way. Yeah. This time they she changed. She took off from from California to Miami. Mm-hmm. And then from Miami. And then they made various stops. Um and, and to that point. But there were some things that they did differently. Um that that needs to be that needs to be brought up because she left behind some very important communication and navigation instruments in order to make room for some additional fuel for the long flight. Mm-hmm. Uh, they also had some new radio technology yeah. on the plane that they feel that probably neither one of them really knew very well. And Well, I think the another uh, a big thing, I don't know if you're going to get to this or not, but is the the first island that they were supposed to take a stop at, there was supposed to be a ship out there that was supposed to relay, like, that was information. The, that was the Atasca. That was right. a Coast Guard cutter mm-hmm. out there that supposedly was going to have to help her navigate... To the island. ...from to, um, what's that island? Um, Howland Island, yeah. I believe it was the name of the mm-hmm. island, was where the scheduled landing was going to take place, and right. there from there go to Hawaii, and then from Hawaii over to the continental United States. Right. But the thing is, is that the, that they didn't, the technology wasn't compatible with each other. Right. That was the, 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 big the, 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 the technology on the plane couldn't go to the high frequency that the cutter was putting out there. And right. so that was part of what happened. But also coming up to this island, they felt they were so close because the actual radio signal was so loud and so clear, they felt like they should be able to see them. And when they disappeared. Yeah, they, they don't know. They, it, you know, it's, and neither one of them knew Morse code either, which, you know, that's something else to, to take in consideration. There, there's, there's, there's a couple things going on here. Um, yeah, they said, you know, and Earnhardt was planning on communicating primarily through voice transmission, just like you said. She believed that the discarded equipment would have amounted to dead weight with just her and Nooning aboard a plane. So, you know, she made some tactical errors there, and it ended up, unfortunately, costing her. 
Um, but, you know, they departed at Miami in June, and their flight path took them to Brazil, Dakar, Katorum, Bangkok, and Darwin, Australia. On June 29th, they arrived at Le New Guinea, their last stop before crossing the Pacific Ocean. And their plan for the remainder of the flight was to fly from Lai to Howland Island, a sandy, uninhabited island midway between Australia and the Hawaiian Islands. And a U.S. Coast Guard cutter named the Itasca was waiting near Howland Island to God, Earhart, and Noonan to the island. They would then continue on to Honolulu and conclude their trip at to, in Oakland, California. Yeah. But before leaving Lai, Earhart sent a telegram to her husband, George Putman, that read, Radio misunderstanding and personnel unfitness probably will hold one day. It's unclear what personnel and radio issues er Earnhardt was referring to in this telegram, but it appears that she was ultimately undeterred. They both departed for Howland Island on July 2nd at 10 a.m. It was the last time either of them would be seen again. Now, what gets interesting here is there are some things that came out that I was reading that um, through some records they found, yeah. uh, the, um, the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, they've been studying this, her death since 1998. Oh, yeah. And they found records where they received, uh, Earnhardt made more than 100 radio transmission calls from the aircraft for help from July 2 to July 6th, which indicates she didn't die in a crash. Mm -hmm. Right. It looks like she was able to probably land the plane somewhere. And then there's now there's a bunch of theories of, of, uh, of where that may have been and right. what happened. And, and I think that leads to some of the bone theories you talked about, Stoney. Hmm. Um, but there are others. Right. So, um, I mean, it's uh, it, it's some good stuff. I mean, it, it really is. Um, well, and I guess early on, um, uh, Dr. Uh, D.W. Hoodlist, a British entomologist, um, found they he they brought these bones that they found. They only found one set of bones, and during the early ages of this forensic knowledge and testing and things like that. He said that the bones were too manly to be Amelia Earhart's. And so they were discarded. But then um, a number of years later, um, a Dr. Uh, Richard Jantz and his team from the University of Tennessee proved using the doctor's measurements, because that's all they had left, that were actually that of a woman and that were 99% accurate that they were Amelia Earhart's using her height, her weight, pictures, and everything else. Yep. And they believed, and this was in 1998, when now we've come so far with this technology, the forensic technology, that they believe that that was Amelia Earhart. But then that gives you some clues into maybe what happened. Where was Noonan? Well, the, you know... I, they only if, found one set of bones. One set of bones, but, uh, you know, uh, you know whether, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if, if Noonan did anything or... Oh, I'm uh, not saying he did. I'm just saying, I'm but just, where was I, it? I'm, I, I'm just, he may have died. Now, what mm. to me is interesting is what I just said about this, 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 this radio, last, radio transmission where they say radio misunderstanding and personnel unfitness probably hold one day. Which indicates to me that one of them was going nuts. Was well that, or was getting sick. Mm -hmm. I mean, that could happen too. Um, so uh, you know whether you know, you know maybe they say, hey, look, we need we need to push forward, and they took off. So by the time she she downs the plane somewhere, well, maybe you, it's out in the water somewhere or somewhere. You got to like think about a couple of things. There there was a. Uh, 
an interview done that I watched a video and they were interviewing her about these flights and they asked her about a sandwich. Did you take a sandwich? Well, I drink lots of water. Did you eat the sandwich? No. Well, back then they didn't have refrigeration. So what are you making? That what are they eating through this whole time? Your your yeah. days flying, right? I, I mean, you eat the wrong tuna fish sandwich, you're done. and you're done. <laughs> yeah. So you know, there's a whole when they say you know personnel and fitness. What if he ate the tuna sandwich and you know started puking and crapping all over the place? You know. Um, so there's so many things that could have gone wrong in this. These these people are trendsetters. You know, today we take for granted so many of the things that we have that they did not have then. The navigation, the radios, the oh, refrigeration, yeah. mm -hmm. just the simple things that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. Even flight today is so commonplace for us, we don't even think about it. Yeah. Right. I mean, we, we know. That's what I'm saying. At that time... You know, you're you're really put. You, I mean, you're you're going out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you really are. And think about how hot it is. You you you've got no ventilation. You you you've added cells for fuel. You've removed everything possible, including some of your communication equipment to add fuel. And now, yeah. Well, they say by the by, the, they immediately began a search for her. Right. The search finally ended on July nineteenth, nineteen thirty seven. Okay. But see, there's the there's official, the next there's the, the next key to that. The official search. Okay. The president launched at the time the largest air and sea rescue that had ever happened. Four million dollars mm -hmm. spent. And it went on. Now, that leads some people to believe that two other theories. One, she was a spy, uh -huh. and they were trying to get her because she had information on that plane because they were looking at what the Japanese were doing in the area and that she was working for the president as a spy. Supposedly. 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 That's Supposedly. what I'm saying. That's right, what I'm saying. Right. That leads to one of the conspiracies. Yeah. And it was a spy mission went wrong. And it was a flight for a cover spy mission, and her disappearance resulted in being caught in enemy territory. Then another one was, was that she was actually captured by the Japanese and taken a prisoner, as a prisoner of war. Well, I, I, you know, following up with that, in November of 1966, retired Marine General Graves B. Erskine, deputy commander of the 5th Amphibious Corps during the Saipan invasion, visits the radio studios of KCBS in San Francisco for an interview with Fred Garner. While waiting to go on the air, Erskine tells Jules Dundes, a CBS West Coast vice president, and Dave McAlton, I believe, a KCBS newsman, quote, It was established that Earnhardt was on Saipan. You'll have to dig the rest out for yourselves. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, supposedly from what I read as well, it's like there was a, a bunch of people that said that they saw the plane and them in like the Marshall Islands, and um, and that there's witnesses that apparently saw that she was captured and also executed. But a lot of those claims were like debunked, and actually the pictures they had found were from you know. Something like five years prior, or something like that. So. Yeah, there, there, there is there. There's a lot of actually interviews. There's been a lot of books that have been put out on on this topic, and they went and actually interviewed a lot of these these people who were around, and they remember seeing yeah Amelia Earnhardt there right. in Japanese custody. Mm -hmm. They say she was killed. Right, that's what I'm saying. So like you know, I is... mean, so. Uh, you know how you take that, but um, supposedly I, directly after the crash took place and stuff, that there was people that um, were able to triangulate the position of it to. I think it was Baker Island, just like south of whatever the main island she was trying to get to was. Yeah, yeah. It, it's you know there's so many different theories. Oh yeah. I mean, I I counted fifteen 
Uh, I we, I thought it was interesting because I thought that she went by herself. I didn't know that she had yeah, like she, a companion yeah, to like a navigator. She, he, was a, he was the navigator. Right. He was that was his strong point. Of course. But I, I believe his strong point was celestial navigation. Right. Mm-hmm. Versus what, unfortunately, because of the clouds, I think that messed with his ability to know exactly where they were. Right. And if and also made, the lack of radio to the right, ship. if she would have had, uh, I think everything hooked up. Maybe the Atasca could have tracked them better right. and directed them to where the island was, where they could have landed. Well, they had this so. new antenna. It was it's a large circle, and basically as it as it moves around, you move it around, and the stronger the it triangulates the signal better. And that's one of the things that wasn't working correctly. They believe that she wasn't able to lock on to the um, the cutter's signal coming in. Yeah. So. I mean, it, there's a lot. I mean, I, I read another one where some, some uh, during World War II, some Australian um, soldiers, uh, I forget what island, but they said they saw a crash plane that, and they pulled the numbers and they it matched the plane of, the Electra that they were that Amelia Hard used. So, yeah. you know, I, I so many of these things, I was like, you know, I, I could, couldn't wrap my mind around all these different because several, several of them actually sounded very plausible. Oh, yeah. You know, but you know, you can't believe this one and this one, right? Because it would contradict one another. So, I don't know. I mean, it's. You know, maybe we'll never know. So I can't believe that she was a spy and still crash landed somewhere. Well, I think if it because I like that. I mean, well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, but you could say that, but I mean, I think if you if you read the theory out in total, yeah. it, it there's would, a few discrepancies. There would be then. some discrepancies mm-hmm. there. Right. So I mean, but I mean, these are I mean, uh, just some of the ones I, I all these the, these kind of theories. The Electra crash landed in the Pacific, which is kind of the established right. story. Right. I, again, whenever I think about, whenever I was in research for this, the first thing that came to my mind is I thought that she went out by herself and then ran out of fuel over the ocean. Uh, and that was it. So like well, doing more research, I didn't know well, that they she were like, getting low. Coming up to that How- Howard Island or Ho- Howland, ha- Howland Howland Island, Island. Yeah. they were low on fuel. Right. That th- was one of the I things. I think she was down to about 90 gallons Right. But, but what I'm talking about point. is I thought that I didn't know that she was going to make like multiple stops. Like I didn't know she was going oh, go to go to Howland Island. I didn't know she was going to go to Hawaii. I thought that she was just going to go. No, and that was didn't. the problem was that she just No, they didn't have enough. They, they had to have right. jump points because of course, the planes. I know that now. But like, yeah. again, when I was like just thinking about, again, what I thought I had learned in school or something or my uh, my basic knowledge of what I thought it was, that was what uh, I just, But that's, that's also something you have to think about. Why would the U.S. government send a Coast Guard cutter to drop fuel and supplies off to somebody doing that. Because he's a national I I, I get it. But think about that. The U.S. government, that's not, during that time, you had to get funding and financing to do that. She got funding for the plane. She bought the plane. She designed the plane. Right. So, but now the U.S. government's going to send out a U.S. Coast Guard cutter which is a Coast Guard cutter to go partly into the ocean right. and bring them fuel and supplies. and uh, I mean, I, I, get, I get what you're getting at, but it, this is also the same, I think underneath the, probably the same president that was like also commenting about how good she was as a pilot. So I, I for me, it doesn't feel um, outside the realm of possibility if she had a team of people that were like reaching out mm-hmm. to the government saying like, hey, we're going to do this like crazy lofty adventure you mind helping us out a little bit? We could, you know, make us both look good. No doubt. At least in my yeah. mind, that's where I go. Like, I mean, I, but you're right, though. That that does kind of seem a little fishy if she was not the person of interest that she is. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if right. she was even just a little bit less famous than that, then it's like, well, why, uh, why are you wasting so much uh, resources on her for just a, a you know, a very critically acclaimed well, film Well, I, I said, there, there's, there's, plenty, there's plenty of theories out there. Some that are plausible, some are far-fetched. Yeah. Um, Do you think uh, that her body got eaten by crabs? Yeah, I saw that one. That was, <laughs> that was one of those theories. I was like, wow. Yeah. I think they were looking at those coconut crabs. Yeah, they seemed to crabs. kind of... 
Um, but yeah, the, the the that running theory goes that they crash landed on that that island, island. That I was talking about, Baker's Island. I think just south of Mon. What is it called? Monland. Howland? Howland. 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 Howland Island. Howland Island. And um, whenever they they uh, were castaways on the island, well, ended up perishing there. And of course, the crabs ate her. Well, th- there is some. I-, I think there is some solid, some solid leads. Uh, I saw where there is an island that they believe, uh, and it's shown promising because a piece of metal washed up on the shore mm-hmm. that matches what that would the Electra would be. You know, that not only of, that, but they were able to the, through modern technology pull some etched numbers off of it right, that match wow. the Electra's exactly. numbers. And they found some landing gear in the yeah. water there. Uh, matter of fact, there's a there was a, a crashed ship that had run up on the reef. Wow. Uh, but they think the plane landed in the air and landed somewhat in the water to a degree. And right. then over time, the tide just basically took the plane out. Yeah. And that would kind of match why the plane was sending off signals after July 2nd. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just was able to stay above water. And eventually, the you know, it, it just right. the tide took it out. And that's the reason the signal disappeared, which would go into if they're stuck on that island. Either she died on the island, or the Japanese may have found her yeah. and took her. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, whether Noonan was still alive at that time, you know, he could have died in the crash. We don't, we don't know, right? But you know, I, I don't. That's crazy. What, what, like what all about, the possibilities? What about the conspiracy where she was reincarnated as Irene God. Bolum? Yes, I was and reading that. And the conspiracy that. claims that Earhart was reincarnated as a woman named Irene Bolum and lived her life under a different identity. Yeah, that so was... So maybe she got tired of the limelight, faked her own death, and yeah, came uh, back to America and just lived her life out. And there's some compelling photographs of both women that look pretty close well they said it, it it that was actually put forth by an author by the name of joe Kloss. Mm-hmm. uh she says she was first captured by the japanese held prisoner eventually then rescued mm-hmm. under and then under a different identity Kloss promoted the theory that earnhardt tired of the spotlight chose to take on a completely new identity as a housewife Irene Bolum, which to me, no one—I don't think I believe that. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, it does. It's built upon because they look alike. But believe it or not, that I, the real Irene Bolum actually filed suit. Mm-hmm. Wow, she was yes. a ba- she was a banker, mm-hmm. and because she was getting tired of, of yeah. all the speculation, and probably her life got turned upside down. When, well, like, are you are you really a Amelia yeah. Earhart? You can imagine how your life would get a, turned upside down trying to fend off accusations that well the best defense is a good offense so maybe she just said you know what i'm going to take this because she's so headstrong let me just take this on and i'm going to sue somebody i'm going to prove to you i'm not amelia Earhart. yeah and also we're dealing with such a like a time in history where like i know that you can do it nowadays i know you can disappear nowadays i just know that it's i feel like it's a lot harder I would time think was back it was a lot day. easier back then, then yeah. you know, than it is now. Because everything was done by mail. You could get a driver's license by mail. You could get a social right. security card by mail. Right. You could get anything and not have to actually show up. I'm just talking about the fact you can also just so you can disconnect and like survive pretty in like in society like that. Nowadays, I feel like you know. Well, he, she uh, that book that that Arthur uh, that book was published by McGraw Hill, and Bolum sued the publisher. Mm-hmm. Wow! Uh, and the book was eventually pulled from the shelves. So yeah. it was. I mean, you know, some people put stuff out there; they don't know what they're really talking about. Speculation, and uh, you know, but well, at that point, like you're writing a book, you can't just like post it on the internet as like a little fun theory. It, it, yeah, you gotta like write it in a book. And you be gotta like, write a, a fun book. Theory. You gotta go through the publishing process <laughs> and everything else. Well, which is interesting because our next topic is integrity and in journalism. Yeah, journalism, <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, so it's. I can't uh, wait for that episode. We're gonna uh, have a great guest on and everything. That's so right. Maybe maybe we can bring this subject it, up to exactly. her. Exactly. I, I would I would like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, another another theory: she was abducted by aliens. Oh God! <laughs> what movie? What movie? Kind of 
kind of touches on that and kind of touches into that theory. Remember that movie that came out Mm-mm. probably around 1980, early 80s? I don't think I know. Or yeah, I think it was early 80s, which and I believe you see the person that looks like her getting off the spaceship was Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh. Really? Yes. I haven't seen that movie before. Yeah. Interesting. They kind of touch on that. Fun. You haven't uh, seen Close Encounters of no. the Third Kind? I, do Alien. I look like the kind of guy that would watch that movie? No. Yes. yes. The Alien movie? No. God, that's okay, a great... It's not, uh, the Alien part of it is it's, actually very... Okay. Very yeah. minimal yeah. at all. I, I've only ever heard this movie talked about by like crazy UFO people. Like, No. Yeah. This is a great movie. I, 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 just, I, I believe it's probably a great movie. I just Every time I, I hear people talking about it, they're also like aliens, UFOs. And I'm like... I. Great. I, I, Your next mission, should oh you choose gosh. to accept it, <laughs> <laughs> is to watch Got it. Close Encounters uh, of the Third Time because it is actually a great movie. Okay. Yeah. Richard, that was Richard Dreyfus. Yeah, yeah, that he that was a monumental. Dr- role Richard Dr- is it Dreyfus Dr- or Dreyfus? Dreyfus, something yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was that was classic. Because because then he turned around and did Mr. Holland's Opus, not yeah. to chase this rabbit, but actually the 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 large one of the best books about Amelia Earhart is called The Rabbit Hole. So right. I'm chasing a rabbit mm. here on the movies, but he did Mr. Holland's Opus, yeah, which is about music, which is amazing. But hey, yes, that's, but, you got you know, some good movies. But there's Why another one in that same vein um, that it was time travel or interdimensional travel. Oh gosh. And that she accidentally traveled through time or another dimension, which is not the first movie to do that again. Um, there was one, uh, I can't remember it, where a battleship disappeared into a dimension and popped out right as the Japanese were getting ready to attack Pearl Harbor. What was the name of that movie? But it's in the same area where they believe that there is a dimensional door hmm. for yeah. that. Another one was Noonan was operating the plane while drunk. What? Yeah. Well, they did say they had alcohol on right. board, so. Uh, the journalist Fred Garner first alleged that Noonan's alcoholism might have contributed to the dis- disappearance of the pair in his 1966 book, The Search for Amelia Earhart. Hmm. Uh, others have come forward to corroborate his theory. In the book, it, it basically points out in a specific example of a co-pilot's drinking problem. A car crash had happened just months before their disappearance in April of 1937, in which it was reported that noon in the driver had been drinking. Um, whether well, that has had anything to do with, you know, you know, is he, you know, not right. being able to focus on what he needed to do and his mind wasn't clear? I, I don't know. I I mean, maybe, but again, we start getting in like those kind of speculations where I'm like, but would Amelia Earhart like allow that? Oh, absolutely. I think when you're flying that long, yes, absolutely. You're just going to have a little no, cat nap. No, you know? I mean, maybe, but what I'm talking about is like, like would, I mean, like, yes, you got a lot riding on the line, but like if my, if my navigator is drunk, I'd be like, no, we're, we're calling it off. Sober up and then we'll go in the morning. Like, I'm just, I'm not going to risk that. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, I, maybe I'm I, wrong, I, but I, I'm still to me the the radio transmission of them saying right. personnel unfitness. I, I think one of them maybe. was sick, maybe, and or, or something had happened, and and you know at that point you're getting desperate. You know we're this close. You know, we've traveled right. all this way, and I can imagine the drive that she had to get this done. Yeah. Uh, uh, she, you need to go ahead and drive now so that uh, when we make it to America, right. I'm fresh and, and exactly. energetic. Right, because... Just a side note, Close Encounters was 77. The movie uh, I'm thinking about was The Final Countdown, which came out in 79 or 80. That was a good show. So it's actually a, the vein... We've talked about this on this show before. Was Hollywood and the government preparing us for interdimensional travel, for aliens, things like that? And so what if these were coming out at that time to kind of prepare us for some of the things that are coming out today? Does it make it more plausible? 
Oh, I mean, so. not for me, but that's just, I, I'm also I'm a cynic when it comes to that. Uh, yeah, you know, right. you are, yeah. I, I think we may have to do another follow-up UFO episode. Uh, I, know, so. on that. I see that one coming. Yes. So. I, mean, I have a, I have some friends that I've been talking to that um, are really big into the stuff happening recently, and I, I, I'm not the person they like to talk to because I'm like, but... but I hear you. You're you're not inherently you. a super cynic, but when it comes to that, you are oh, kind of a little cynical bit because I'm like because I'm like I want I want proof, and that's the problem is that no one can give me substantial proof. All the proof that I get is not proof in my opinion. I want credible proof. Well, like, and that's then, the thing. Then you right now probably lend that she just crashed into the Pacific Ocean. Right oh, that's now. what I'm saying, okay. and that's what I'm saying. And that I would think, right? That's the official narrative. Yeah, yeah. that's what you I'm know, saying. But there's been some other things that have but come I, up. I, and I, but when I'm when I'm speaking about that, I'm talking about more like the aliens, uh, UA, that, UAPs. Like, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I, I'm talking about not just in like the aspect of Amelia Earhart, just like the whole conversation with what's happening recently about the whole like UAP stuff and. There's a lot of it's stuff. So happening funny with, how the government reclassified yeah, right, as right. a UAP so they can uh, somehow defeat the Freedom of Information Act, <laughs> where people mm-hmm. wouldn't be able to. Uh, well, I think that there's also a big st- info. There's a big stigma, I think, also with UFO. I think that's that's a, there's a lot from uh, decades long past that I think gives a- ever um, since Project Blue Book. You're right. Mm-hmm. It is. You're it right. has been this <laughs> right. idea, but I'm telling you, yeah. uh, it's. I I think. It's fixing the bus loose. I think well, it's just I got, too much I, I had a friend of mine want to slap me because what Uh-oh. I did in the uh, the AI episode when I asked, you know, the question of using the irony of using AI to research AI and then asking it about yeah. the three rules of robotics and said, do you believe in them? And it said, no, you're all going to die. They said that was um, kind of... Uh, in the same vein of what was that War of the Worlds? Yeah, who, who did that? For what is his George name? Orwell? Or, or, Orson Welles. Orson Welles. <laughs> Orson yeah. Welles did that, and it was like a newscast until it right. got out. They were yeah. like, "That is so Orson Welles this of you." And why would you do that to us? But then you know what? Are are we being prepared for something? You know, I like I like the fact that you know people are. Um, preparing us for something coming. And then when the recent news events popping out in the news conferences saying that, oh, yeah, there is actually something out there, get ready. And I'm I'm ready. <laughs> well, I, I, right. yeah, it, I think it's already there. I've always accepted the premise of, of Alien, so it's nothing that really would surprise me. Um. But you know, real quick, I mean, just kind of following through some of these these uh, these these theories. Uh, another one is she faked her own death for love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, this one, but her and George, who George was on his second, you know, this was his second wife, um, and they they basically ran off together and 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 they did their own thing. I mean, another one is after being captured by the Japanese, she became Tokyo Rose. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for a short time after her disappearance, the theory that Earnhardt had assumed a new identity as Tokyo Rose mm-hmm. while being held captive in Japan was so popular that even her husband started investigating to find out if it was true. So it wow. obviously it was making a lot, it, it was circulating out there, uh, according to the History Channel. Right. They said, unfortunately for Putman, didn't recognize the voice of Tokyo Rose, an English-speaking broadcaster in Japan, who transmitted messages to Allied soldiers in the South Pacific during World War II. It was later discovered that the undercover ally was actually Iva Ukuto Toguri D. Aquino, an American citizen and daughter of Japanese immigrants, who, along with several other female radio show hosts, fought to help America win World War II. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, I mean, another one is she became a nurse in Guadalcanal. <laughs> I love all these, like, outlandish ideas. I mean, you I'm know, like, it, yeah. there's a ton of them out there. You're right. Uh, but, you know, because originally when she went, when she enrolled, was going to enroll in college in Columbia, she enrolled in medical studies. Right. She mm-hmm. she She really was very much inspired by her time of treating World War I veterans yeah. that were injured from the war. And and she had that sense of, of wanting to kind of go in that direction until she but, started But maybe climbing. she also, when, when the plane crashed or whatever, she didn't want to have to come face all the answers about, well, if you were a man, he'd have made it. 
or maybe you didn't make it because you're a woman. Because people are brutal. Mm-hmm. Even back then, the media oh, yeah. was brutal. Maybe not as brutal as it yeah. is today. But maybe she didn't want to face that inquiry and maybe faked her own death. Maybe did something, came under a new identity or did something else or went, chose love other than having to come answer all these tough questions. Well, you know, it's funny that you, you say that. It, it, and I, I've got another quote from her. She wrote a letter to her, a letter to her husband before she left. And she goes, please know I am aware of the hazards. I want to do it because I want to do it. Women must try to do things as men has tried. When they fail, their failure must be but a challenge to others. Right. So she was, um, you know, I, and she was she was going to go do something. Right. And there was nothing that was going to stop her from mm-hmm. doing it. So even though... Maybe the situation under someone that maybe didn't have that much of a drive. Right. Maybe they would have said, you know what, now we, we, we're stopping. You know, things ain't, things ain't working out. Right. Too many bad things are happening right now. We're having problems. Uh, but, but it's people like her that they're just not deterred by that. Yeah. You know, I'm going to go out there and if I die, I die. Mm-hmm. Well, that, they, those, that's, those that's, are, that's the, that's, I mean, that's the, that's the ending age of the true explorers too. Right. I mean, she was an explorer. Look at all the people who were circumventing the globe on ships. And, and this was just a new ship. This was just a new way to go explore something. Um, and she was of a dying age. Right. And she was a female doing it also. She just didn't know how to say no or stop. Uh, Maybe. Uh, or it could just be a freak accident or something happened unexpected. Just uh, there you go. Another theory is she, they crashed on New Britain Island. Uh, New Britain Island is an island on the eastern edge of Papua New Guinea that was directly in the final stretch of Earnhardt's flight path. Now, there are some that say when she was getting low on fuel that they turned around. Yeah. Instead of keeping on going, and it ended up crashing on this island. But then how do you get so close to Howard Island and the Coast Guard cutter hearing you so close? I know. That they're looking uh, for them because they're so close we can hear them, we should be able to see them. So that, uh, you know, that puts a little distance well, they, between that last radio transmission. It, the, the, they say the major stakes in 1943, an Australian Army cor- corporal claimed that an aircraft engine with a Pratt and Whitney serial number was found on the island. Earnhardt's plane contained an engine made by that company. Mm-hmm. Researchers have since concluded that it would have been impossible for Earnhardt and Noonan to make the 2,000-mile journey from Howland Island where the pair sent out radio transmissions delay, detailing their lack of fuel to New Britain Island. So, and the crazy thing is, too, there's also stories of people like in the Navy and the Air Force of their um, their instruments go down and you have to fly by vision alone. And it does not take long to get really turned around in the clouds. Right. And I've heard that time and time again from numerous professionals. They're like, if you are going to go into any kind of inclement weather, any kind of clouds, you better be looking at your instruments because that's going to tell you where you're at and not what you're seeing. Because, again, you can get so crossed up because you don't know if you're upside down, if you're backwards. Like, there's all those things because of the way, like, momentum is working and how all the stuff... So, like, that's another factor as well is, like, you know, what happens if, like you were saying, there's some sort of cloud cover, you can't see the stars, you can't see the sky or whatever, and you're just, um, at that time, you didn't have any, like, instruments, or if you did, they were probably very minimal. Um, and you're just trying your best, and you're just getting crossed up, and, of course, you're, because I think there's even a story about that, um, about, I want to say it was a couple of Navy pilots were doing training and um they were supposed to go i think from somewhere in like the bahamas or something like that to florida but they didn't take the correct path or whatever they got caught up in weather and they were facing the opposite direction they just started flying out into the ocean well i I have i have two words for you 
Bermuda Triangle. No, no. And I would love no, to do a no, show on the no, Bermuda Triangle. No. Yes. Talking about, no. that, talking about that, some say that's kind of what happened with the uh, the torpedo squadron mm-hmm. that disappeared. Yes. Well, there's, they still there's been so find. many so many planes and ships that have disappeared in that little area right there that it's ridiculous. Well, you know, Not they've true. kind of been talking about that area of the ocean for a long time. I mean, mm-hmm. I believe back in Christopher Columbus's era, they mm-hmm. kind of believe it was the Saragossa Sea. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you can't, you know, I look at those things. I, you just can't just automatically dismiss it. There, there's something going on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, why that particular stretch of ocean seems to be a hotbed of, of. I did some research on it recently, and from what I've been told by a lot of people, it's not a whole lot of it's not substantiated. But that's just my research on it, so I could be wrong. But yeah, I've mm-hmm. heard from people who used to live in Bermuda, and they're like, "Yeah, we don't really talk about it because it's like not really a big deal, and nothing really happens out there. It's all just kind well, of well." No, there's a Ameri- lot of people, a right, lot right, of right. ships and planes drive, yeah, you yeah. know, fly and sail through that area of ocean. Right. That, but there is a lot that yeah, some right. things have happened to. You're right, and there's been some stories that are, are very fantastical and and what people experience there so i don't know if it's there's any truth to it or not but you know right it just kind of makes well, our world a little bit more mysterious <laughs> but yeah. what, what is it the nazaki uh runways where the mountaintops have been flattened cut off and flattened and there's such a strong magnetic field underneath these mountains that you can't when you bring your um measurement instruments to measure it 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 wipes them out because it's so strong what if what if that and something in the bermuda triangle there's there's tales of maybe atlantis being down there and things like that what it what if there's something down there that's causing something to happen um i can't remember exactly the mountain names but there the mountains have been artificially flattened with runways and they're before our times and they've just been found there Mm. but that magnetic field is so strong that they can't even measure it well i mean i I think there are places on earth that you know there's things going on that we don't understand i really do i think there's probably some just the physics or just you know something's all mixed up um, and it does weird things, and we don't really know how to explain that. Right. So, um, personally, I think the world is a little more boring than people give it credit for, and I think that um, whenever things happen and there is no definitive evidence on what actually happens or lack thereof, I think it's just a hotbed for people to like really come up with crazy <laughs> conspiracy theories. <laughs> So, like, I mean, if I was to just disappear tomorrow out of nowhere, even if you had some, like, evidence, like, you can come up with one of a hundred different conspiracy theories based on it. And all of them could sound really real. But I think uh, in reality, the boring part of it is, like, he just ran away. and <laughs> That's just the way it is. You know what I mean? Like, what happened to me at her- Earhart? Most likely the plane just crashed in some way or some sort of malfunction or just mishap on all the people involved and then an accident happened and cost a bunch of lives and that was all it was well, but, but she but, wasn't but, a boring lady so you're right who, who but, wants but, her to go out and in you're a right boring and, that's, way. and that's what i'm saying it's like that, that's not fun to say that but that's kind of i think sometimes how the world works it's like a lot of times we can we can watch a movie and suspend our disbelief we can watch a movie with like superheroes and dragons and we're like yeah i can suspend my disbelief in this movie but the second like like because it's so far disconnected but the second that like a movie writes something in it that is like a coincidence that like or is how something would like normally happen in the world or in nature or you know whatever it may be um all of a sudden it's a little too close to reality and we're like well that can't be true mm-hmm. that's that's poor writing you know it's like those kind of things where it's like you know what are the so uh, why do movies have to be more realistic and pass the sniff test more than real life does. Right. I don't know. I've never understood that. Yeah, because the whole this is a movie is just to entertain me. It's, right. It's, That's the only reason it's, I'm it's watching it. It's an escape. It. Go away for a right. while. But I think it's also, it's like the fact that we know that it's written, we know that it's uh, 
uh, we know that it's put on. It, um, we are very uh, particular about um, things that happen in the story because we know mm-hmm. it's all by a choice. Right. Whereas, like, like a good, uh, I mean, a, a prime example. I was at a bookstore uh, a couple days ago, and I was walking around, and I, out of happenstance, ran into an old friend of mine. And uh, I had a great conversation with him. Haven't talked to him in a long time. And I was like, wow, what are the chances of meeting him here? And then I walked upstairs, rounded the corner, and then I found a second friend of mine who was also in the same bookstore, which, again, this is not some place I go to often. This is not some place that those friends go to very often. It's like, what are the likely, what is the likelihood of me meeting two friends of mine in the same place and having a conversation with them which is like a place I don't go to very often. And it's like, that is just something that happened in life that like, I am just like, wow, what a coincidence. But if something like that was written in a movie, we have a hard time like uh, suspending our disbelief to believe that. Cause like that just feels like poor writing. You just, they just just so happened to be at the same place at the same time. Both of those friends, that's unlikely. But the second, like a, you know, the second Godzilla blasted a building, we're like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's just how it works. <laughs> And I feel like that's the same sort of thing with some of these stories like that is that like, you know, the likelihood of, um, I can't think of any stories like, like right now, but like, like other characters that we've like, we've, we've talked about on this show or, or accidents or things that happen in the, in the, in the world, the likelihood of it being something that's just a coincidence or just an accident or just something that just happens is probably, it is it probably exactly what happened, but I just feel like we we don't want to believe that that's it because I just feel like it has to be more cinematic than that. It has to be more than that. It can't just be... <laughs> something simple. Something simple. Mm-hmm. Amelia Earhart probably just crashed in the ocean and that was the end of her life, sad to say. But whenever you think about it, you're like, but that just feels like lazy writing. And it's but, like, but that wasn't... <laughs> but how many people did she inspire You're right. to be You're explorers, right. to become pilots? You're how many right. women, how many men yep. did she... She, 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 just the imagination that she generated for so many young people and people. Yeah. And, and it, these things just make your imaginations run wild. I really, I, I feel the same way she does about uh, flying, but I don't think I have, I chased after it with the same passion that she did. Um, I've, well, you've I've talked told, about I've wanting to be a pilot. Story. I've, on I've, the, I've yeah. told the story about you know how the first time I was in a plane and it took off the ground, I was like, "This is such an amazing feeling," and I want to have this feeling again and again and again. Now, again, obviously, I have other passions and other things that I was doing in life, and you know, yes, one day I think it'd be great to get my pilot's license because I think it'd be so cool to be able to fly fly a plane. So, do I have the same like passion and gusto that she does? No, but. But I, has the story inspired well, you a little I mean, bit more to maybe, become a pilot? See? Maybe so. But I think more then, so, I just think it helps me empathize with that person that I have had that feeling before of experiencing something, of feeling something, of uh, of going through that moment where you're like, this is amazing and I want to do this again and I want to keep doing this again. I've had that with music in my life. I've done that with other avenues. Um so like so I get I I really can get behind what she's saying. Then when it comes eighty to that. years later, she's still inspiring people. Yes, right. she's still creating and generating something about flying, right. even though it's commonplace now. And I think that's that's the legacy of Amelia Earhart. There's always going to be stories about people that have been explorers and trendsetters and right. did things that nobody else did before. And that's why I think she's captured the imagination of the world's imagination. The, the whole world was thinking about this woman and following her and, and how many people have followed and tried to follow in her footsteps. Right. Wow. Well, I'm reading a, 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 an article up uh, down, uh, looks dated July 27th of 2022, Amelia Earhart's statue joins the U.S. Capitol Statuary Hall. Wow. So, the statue of uh, Amelia Earhart uh, is now in the National Statuary Hall inside the U.S. Capitol. Okay. So, mm. she has a statue. I believe the way it works is each state has, like, 
two statues. Really? Um, I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, the statue is one of two to represent Kansas. Wow. Uh, each state gets to choose a pair to represent them. Okay. Wow. Earhart, who was born in Atchison, Kansas, is replacing Kansas Senator John James Ingalls. Wow. That makes her the 11th woman in the collection. There you go. So, she is now... Um, well, is there anything else you want to touch on for this... Uh, for this episode, is there anything else you want to we want to dig into? No, man. I think we've we've covered her pretty good. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's a lot of research, a lot of in depth uh, information on kind of those final events and a little bit more detailed explanations of some of the the rescue uh, attempts to try to find her. It's a lot of good information on some of these what I call plausible theories. Right. I still think some of these theories have some legs that, you know, um, yeah, it's easy to say that she crashed in the, in the ocean and the, right. and the plane is probably in about 10,000 feet of water, maybe. But also there's enough information on a couple of these other things that I believe are worthy of further pursuit, which I think some of these groups are. Mm-hmm. doing that no, so you know what the titanic happened within a couple <laughs> of decades of this thing and did it just hit the iceberg or what is the other stuff with it too True. so amelia Earhart, did she just crash or was the other stuff to it because the way information was passed along back then was so different now right things could be different and you just don't know and and people trusted a little bit more the official reports and only a few people would, you know, look at the conspiracies. And today we are conspiracy theorists. That's what we do. So, you know, some more cynical than others, <laughs> but, you know, we're, that's what right. we do. We're always looking for that next thing. Yeah. And, and we don't want to be boring. Nobody wants to be boring anymore. No. Yeah. I, I, I drive poor Miranda crazy. <laughs> you know, I told her when I, you know, after the, the uh, um, diabetic coma that almost took me and, all my friends didn't ask about my stuff. They just wanted to know where my recipe book was. Mm, I see. You know, I, I came up with two things for my funeral. And poor Miranda, I drive her crazy whenever I talk about Uh-oh. this. Two things are going to happen. One, I want everybody to tell a story. Yeah. You can make it up. You can lie. You can tell the <laughs> truth. Whatever you want to do, just yeah. don't be mean-spirited. Got it. And I, want, I just, you know, build that rep up. However yeah. you want to tell it, tell it. And then when it's all said and done, everybody gets a taser. The last person standing gets all my shit. (laughs) (laughs) Wow, there you go. Uh, Nobody wants to be boring. uh, Yeah, I I don't have those sort of elaborate uh, instructions from when, uh, you know, I, you know, when the good Lord uh, chooses to uh, take me into the afterlife. But uh, I guess now uh, that I'm married, I may have to change up my will a little bit, right? Yeah. No, I don't have anything like that. So, but no, this has been a good topic. I, yeah. I've I've enjoyed doing some research. I have uh, a lot of things, you know. Of course, like anything, I've heard of Amelia Earhart. I never really dug into it till right. I had to do this right. for this episode. Same. And there's a lot of information out there on her. Very fascinating woman. Uh, I think an inspiration for any any lady out there today, any, you know, young person who feels like they can't do something. Yep. Um, she there proved are, you can. Yeah, <laughs> she proved that you can. In a and, time where that was not. Right. That, that was, that do. was not. And there was probably a lot of, of, a lot of other women looking her at a time going, you know, woman's crazy or something, you know, I mean, it's right. uh, sort of like, you know, what I said in the, uh, in the article in the French press where they ended the article and can, <laughs> can she bake a cake? Right. She always had a nice, a little quick return of on that. So she was a very smart woman. She was very witty. Um, and she just didn't like to be shackled. Right. And uh, so for all our lady listeners <laughs> out there, you know, this is a person to maybe read about, learn a right. little bit about her. And uh, it's because of women like that is why we have the society we have today. That's right. Right. Absolutely. Exactly. So, you know, I, I Sometimes we're ignorant of our own history. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I think she's a very fascinating woman. And uh, 
I, I can appreciate and respect what she did for for women and for for aviation in general. Yeah. Um, I mean, she pushed boundaries, and she decided to uh, hmm. not fade away, but to burn out. Right. And um, uh, which I think is very fitting. Yeah. Um, for someone like herself. Right. And so. if you do want to read the rabbit hole. The Disappearance of Amelia Earhart and, and Noonan is actually a pretty good read. It's big, but it covers a lot of the stuff that we did today and in a bit more detail, but we, we have 45 minutes to an hour to do it. Right, right. right. But um, it's actually a pretty good read. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, for anybody out there who is looking to uh, reach out to us or to find any of our stuff, we have this cool uh, these cool dot cards now that's got all of our stuff on it. You can go to dot. Uh, dot cards um, forward slash retrospect pod and that is how you can find all of our links and all the different platforms that we're on you can share that with all your friends and all that stuff Um, but anyways until next week thank you so much for listening bye bye goodbye everyone god bless you're the best peace peace